um, you know, the 2D quantum hole state. And indeed, there's no reason why this, the 4D quantum hole um, um, state is compatible with time reversal symmetry because unlike the 2D quantum hole effect where the transport equation was this, okay, sigma i, j, e, j, and this was off diagonal. Current breaks time reversal. This doesn't break time reversal. So in order to have this equation, you must have time reversal breaking. In four dimensions, the equation is, so this is actually a coefficient times epsilon ij, epsilon mu, nu, lambda, theta, delta, f mu lambda, f theta delta. This is, you can recognize this, that this is f zero j, the field strength. These are real magnetic fields and real electric fields. This is, no matter which coefficient you pick here, if this is a current, so if this is spatial, if this breaks time reversal, one of these would need to be a magnetic field. And that magnetic field breaks time reversal also. So the actual transport is not epsilon times e, but epsilon times e dot b in four dimensions. So this breaks time reversal, this breaks time reversal, this coefficient doesn't need to break time reversal. And this coefficient is the, 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 the second Chur number in four dimensions. Okay? So four dimensional quantum hole effect, perfectly compatible with time reversal, which it needed to be because vials, which the 4D quantum hole effect gives on the surface, are also compatible with time reversal. Okay, any questions? Yes. When you have what? Yes. So when you have when you have time reversal but broken inversion, you need four. When you have inversion broke, uh, you have time reversal broken but inversion, you only need two. What's the case that we have here? What's, sorry. What? 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 Yeah. Oh. We had four. So when you, we, we broke inversion but kept time reversal. Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. No, good, good. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what we've gone through is all these doubling theorems and finding, you know, the, the fact that semi-metals kind of sit in between topological insulators, and they have a very deep connection with topological insulators, which is, which is um, you know, which we've exposed in the past two lectures. Now, I want to do something before I go to the, to the, uh, to the uh, two dimensions, uh, superconductors, if I get there. I want to show you something, something even um, uh, more complicated about semi-metals. So what we've argued that if I have time reversal symmetry, a one electron per unit cell. cell a one electron per unit cell system is what has to be what? Can it be an insulator with time reversal symmetry? Can it be an insulator, one electron per unit cell? What is it? A half filled, half filled metal. Okay? How about if you have two electrons per unit cell? Can a system with time reversal be an insulator with time reversal symmetry? So with two electrons per unit cell, it would seem that if you just have time reversal, you can have, you can have um, um, an insulator. But if you add symmetries, 
and this is, this is something that I wanted to, 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 to make sure it's understood. If you add symmetries, you can make two, so this with just time reversal would sit here at the Fermi level. If you add symmetries, this type of a system can again be a semi-metal. And this relates to what um, you know, Moise was talking about at the very beginning, non-symorphic symmetry. So I'm going to introduce the concept of non-symorphic symmetries now and show you that, that a two electron per unit cell in a system actually has, has um, a, um, um, has to be a semi-metal, cannot be an insulator. So I want to do in 1D this type of a lattice, okay? Any, any structure within this triangle is possible, but this is the type of the lattice where I want to put my system, okay? Consider this as a, you can think of this as a dot even, it's just when you want to use itself. And consider time reversal invariance with t squared equals minus one, okay? And consider symmetry, a symmetry which is mirror. So we call this Z, call this X, mirror X. Now, is mirror a symmetry? What's the unit cell? This is the unit cell, right? Is mirror X goes to minus X a symmetry of this system? What do I have to do to make it a symmetry? Okay. So I don't have mirror as a symmetry, but I have mirror plus translation. And translation by exactly what? Half of the unit cell, thank you. This is a good symmetry of the system. Now, these things are called group extensions. They're non-symorphic symmetries. And they're related to group extensions. For example, do you think you can have a system where you have a symmetry that's mirror plus a translation by a third of a unit cell? No. And in fact, there's only two ways to implement mirror symmetry. One way is the following, okay, the trivial way. And one way is this one. This one is the non-symorphic, this one is the symorphic one. Okay? And the way you realize this is you're just trying mirror, this mirror squared is equal to one, this one. So this is a Z2 group. One if you've got spin, if you don't have spin, minus one if you have spin, because you also rotate. Let's just do one for the, for the beginning. I'll go to minus one soon. This is a Z2 group. And what you want to understand is there's another type of mirror that enhances this Z2 group by the group of translations. So I'm going to try to extend this by the group Z, which is just translations by a unit cell. Now, the way you figure out group extensions, well, you can compute cohomology groups, but the easiest way to figure out that there's only two of them, group extensions, is the following. What you want to do is to extend the group. So the, the way you can extend the group is by making mx squared not equal to the identity, but every element that you want to extend the group will act as the identity. So you make translation by the lattice constant to the power x, okay? So I'm, or to the power m, whatever. m is an integer, okay? And I'm going to figure out how many gauge invariant ways of doing it are there. Well, one gauge symmetry in a lattice is I can also, I can only make m, I can, all, I can always make m mirror symmetry, but I can also make m times the translation. A lattice which should has to be invariant under this symmetry by a translation by a whole unit cell, not a half a unit cell. Okay? If I do this transformation, then this rule becomes mx squared is equal to 2 to the m plus 2. Okay? Notice that whatever power I put here, so say I put 2 to the n, I take mirror and I make, this is just a gauge transformation because I'm just translating by a unit cell, the, the mirror. This changes the group multiplication law to t to the m plus 2n. So this immediately shows you that there's only two distinct ways that are not related by gauge invariance. Gauge invariance in our 
in our system means just translating by any number of unit cells the mirror operation. And those ways are m is equal to 0 and m is equal to 1. m is equal to 0 is just this one. m is equal to 1 is the non-somorphic one. Because m, when m is equal to 1, that means mirror squared is equal to a full lattice translation. So it means mirror is equal to a, well, the operation x to minus x plus 1 half lattice translation. Does that make sense? So we've proved that there's only two ways. Yeah? So then my group contains mirrors, this new mirror operator, call it m bar, my non somorphic group, which is the lattice translation times a minus one if I want spin, spin one half. Because spin one half, two mirrors also flip the spin and you get a minus sign. Okay? So I've got this group, t squared is equal to minus one. And of course, time reversal commutes with every mirror operator because mirror is spatial. This is my group in one dimension. Let's, let's ask how bands, what, what, what this group imposes on bands. What's the symmetry, what, what's the symmetry that this group imposes on bands? What do bands have to do with this? OK. Well, how do I express a translation by a phase in block space, if I go to momentum space. What is this? What's the translation if I'm at momentum k and translate by, by a, what is it? What's the translation? e to the i, k. So in momentum space, which is, I want to go to bands, this is e to the i k. I'm in one dimension, so let's forget about this kz. Right? Just remember that mirror is the mirror you know, doesn't change kz, right? Mirror, it's x to minus x, doesn't change this momentum, but this is the group, okay? In block um, um, representation. So if I, this is the representation of this group on the block um, functions. So now, this means that the eigenvalues of mirror are plus or minus i e to the i k over 2. Agree? OK, so I'm going to call them plus or minus this. This is what indexes plus and minus. So now let me see if I can figure out what bands have to do between 0 and pi, not 2 pi. Well, because I have time reversal here, bands have to come in what? Pairs. So I'll have pairs here, Kramer's pairs here, OK? So normally, with just time reversal, I could just have two bands that do this. And of course, I would need to time reverse them and make them on the other. Yeah? Is that clear? But this system doesn't support two bands. You cannot have the minimal number of bands in the system is four. And that's why if you've got, if you've got two electrons per unit cell, this is a semi-metal with this symmetry. Just by adding the symmetry, you've enforced semi-metallic behavior with two electrons per unit cell. Let's find out why. Well, <coughs> at k equals to 0, what are the eigenvalues? So this is the function of k. Plus, minus at 0, what are they? Are they real or imaginary? Plus, minus i. Time reversal has complex conjugation in it. So these two doublets, one of them is the time reversal of the other. These two doublets, what are their two eigenvalues under mirror? Plus, minus, plus i and minus i. It doesn't matter which one is which. These ones have to have either plus or minus i. OK? OK. So at this point, Two branches of eigenvalues, plus and minus, have to stick together. Now let's look at k equals pi. What are the eigenvalues, plus and minus? Hmm? What are they? Minus plus 1. Now they're real. So time reversal 
when it acts so on this doublet, diamond versus complex conjugation, what does it do to a real eigenvalue? Nothing. So what are the eigenvalues here? Either plus plus or minus minus. I don't know which ones. Let's say plus plus, obviously, without loss of generality. Now, you can clearly see that there's no way to interpolate between here and here, because my eigenvalues are defined by plus and minus. Here I just have plus minus, here I have two pluses. There's no way to interpolate to, between, between these two while keeping mirror symmetry. I just have, here there's just two eigenvalues with plus, here's this eigenvalues with plus minus. Hence, it means that the minimal system that I can have is another one where I have minus, mi let's see, plus, plus here, four bands, minus, minus here. Here there's still plus i or minus i and plus i. Okay? And now I can interpolate between them. The moral of the story, plus has to go to plus to keep the eigenvalue. Minus has to go to minus. Okay? So what this system will do is this plus goes to plus. This minus, what you have to keep constant across a, the mirror line is this label. Okay? Minus goes to minus. This is a doublet here. Plus goes to plus. Minus goes to minus. Okay? So this was the minus eigenvalue. This was the plus eigenvalue. Along this line, the eigenvalue is minus i e to the i k over 2. This eigenvalue is plus i e to the i k over 2. This eigenvalue is minus i e to the i k over 2. This eigenvalue is plus i e to the i k over 2. Why doesn't this point open? If this point opened, I could still get, I could still separate things and have two bands connecting. Why doesn't that point open? Anybody? Why doesn't this gap open here? Why is this crossing point protected? Exactly. It comes from eigenvalues plus and minus. They're exactly the opposite, two different eigenvalues of a unitary operator. No term that maintains mirror symmetry can open a gap between these bands. You see, the minimum band number here is four. It's called four band connectivity. Hence, if I have two electrons per unit cell, so if I have here, one elect, you know, a material is one electron, not, you know, if it, this, my unit cell looks like this, but if I have a material just one electron in the outer shell, my Fermi level is always stuck here. Okay? And this is an enforced semi metal. Of course, you can violate this thing by going to higher dimensions, but then you're going to find this type of a surface as a surface state of a 3D topological insulator, which is a non-somorphic topological insulator, etc. So I don't know if I actually have time to go through. Uh, to probably not, right? right. Thanks, uh, how much you think about, uh, like ten minutes? I don't know. Two D super. I mean, it's up to you guys. If you guys want to go to lunch or yeah. It's not forced to state exactly here, but it's forced to, it's not, you see, this can topologically, this can look like this, right? It can look like, let's call it hourglass for different reasons. Well, it can look like this. So then the Fermi level can sit, you know, somewhere, somewhere. It actually, no, it has to sit, yeah. It has to, so, well, depends. If you have it do something like this, it can it can move away from the from the from the Fermi point. But basically, you have to sit at half filling. Okay, this is in this picture. If there's nothing that does this, then then you're stuck in the middle. Okay, because it gets you, have, you just have half you have to have half number of bands. If this thing doesn't doesn't do that, you're even stuck in the middle. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, so. 
I'm going to very quickly go to two-dimensional superconductors, now that you know everything about Majoranas. So, and I'm going to ask the following question. I'm going to ask the question whether, by the way, every semi-metal that you build like this can also be made a superconductor. All you need to do is change the bases. These are single particle systems. The only information about whether it's a superconductor or not doesn't rest in these symmetries. It rests in the choice of bases that you put, or the choice of, the choice of well, more, more appropriately said, the choice of operators that you, that you put. So for example, every Hamiltonian that we wrote up to now, so let me just write down this Hamiltonian in two dimensions sine kx sigma x plus sine ky sigma y plus m minus cosine kx minus cosine ky sigma z. Okay? This doesn't contain any C operators in it, so it's the first quantized single particle Hamiltonian. And, you know, it's kind of a quintessential example of a Chern insulator, right? If, if you, this, is, does this look familiar to some of you? So if m here is less than 2, this has a whole conductance, OK? But if I just give you this, you wouldn't know if it's an insulator or a superconductor, OK? This is a to k. What I also have to give you is the basis states. So this is h of k. The Hamiltonian is sum over h of k. And here I have some psi k, psi bar, psi dagger k. If psi of k is c s orbital at k, c p orbital at k, and the reason why it's s and p is because they couple through an L equal 1 um, term. These are the off-diagonal matrices. It can't be just s orbitals, for example, at the same side. It's got to be s and p, for example, for this. Then this is an insulator because you see it doesn't, it doesn't, it has good particle number. But now if I, instead of that, choose psi of k to be ck, c minus k dagger, OK? Then this is a superconductor. And it's a topological superconductor while you're at it. OK? Now you can clearly see that this guy here doesn't maintain particle number because you're going to have C dagger terms, C dagger terms, okay? Especially these ones, right? This is a P plus IP superconductor. You can see that if you take this, you're going to have CK dagger here coupling to sine KX plus I sine KY to C minus K dagger, right? So this is clearly a superconductor. And it's a superconductor which has got, which is, which has, which, um, since I have a, the single particle Hamiltonian, first quantized, was the same as that of a Chern insulator. If I just diagonalize the spectrum of this guy on an open boundary condition, I'm going to see an edge state. Right? I haven't changed anything. I've just changed the basis. Well, I've just changed not my basis, but my Hilbert space. OK? Does that make sense? So. In single particle, superconductors are just insulators with another symmetry. Of course, there you have to keep track of that symmetry because it's not really a symmetry, it's a redundancy. And that redundancy makes Majorana what it is. You know, the particle hole symmetry is not a symmetry. You've just doubled your Hilbert space. So it's just a redundancy, and you describe your Hilbert space in an overcomplete description. That's the only way you can diagonalize your Hamiltonian. So then your zero energy states become particle n holes. OK, so let's do the, the, let's look at this Hamiltonian on, on a disk for m less than 2. What do we say that it's got a turn number? If I diagonalize this, I'll get an edge state. Do we, is everybody, I don't know if this is clear or not. Like, you can use, like, you know, throw something. Like, you know, 
I, I need like some feedback. Is this clear or not? Because if it's not, I can just go. To, you know, I can say more things. But like, you know, there's no point in me asking if it's clear or not and getting annoyed without like feedback. So, is it clear or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have this guy has an edge state on a disk if m is less than 2. It's got a churn number. If you want to see that it's got a churn number, come and talk to me after this, the lecture. OK? So if I was to plot it versus a momentum here, the circular momentum on the disk, OK, then it would look something like this. OK, now since it's a superconductor, we know superconductors have the following symmetry. OK, this is from what Alexander said. This is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. OK, so for every state at energy E, there's, this is the particle hole redundancy. You know, we call them symmetries, but they're, this is just, just expressing everything in this basis like this. This Hamiltonian, you will have that symmetry. If it doesn't have this symmetry, this basis will just make that term be 0, will make that term disappear. So pick something that doesn't have that symmetry, take this basis, and you'll see that it's 0. You'll make it, you'll make it, you'll make it vanish. OK, so with this symmetry, momentum is quantized units of 2 pi over L. This is L. So let's just draw this quantization. OK? Can I have, what I want to ask you is, can I have something that looks like this? I'm just drawing this quantization like this. OK? Can I have something that looks like this? In other words, can I have a zero mode, exact zero mode here, this is 2 pi, this is the edge mode, this is the chiral mode. Since I put it on a disk, I don't have the other surface. Okay, I don't have, if I put it on a cylinder, I would have the other surface. If I put it on a disk, I don't have the other surface. And, and can I have this type of a, of, so I have a chiral mode running around, so this is my chiral mode. But can I have this type of a, of a, of a dispersion? All of these are, you know, okay. What do you think? Well, the answer is no. But why not? If I had this type of dispersion, how many levels would I have in my Hamiltonian? So, no, no, I mean, I, I have, you know, my Hamiltonian has a, a shitload of levels. But there's, there's a parity that's, that's odd. Is it clear that if I have this mode, just one mode at zero, with one edge, it's an odd, I would have odd number of levels. An odd number of levels happens in any, not in this Hamiltonian, this is a, you know, a model in any superconducting Hamiltonian. Why? Very good. So any superconducting Hamiltonian, even if I had some other orbitals, C alpha k, and this is fundamental, this doesn't happen here. I could have, in an insulator, I could have three levels, OK, for example. But in a superconducting Hamiltonian, for every alpha of k, I have to have an alpha of minus k with a dagger. This is where the redundancy comes in. So this picture is wrong. I can't have this. So what does it mean? Well, it means that there's no way to put a chiral, this is chiral superconductor, on a disk with what type of boundary conditions are you going to have if you have the zero mode. So that means that k is 2 pi over L, the difference in k is 2 pi over L. But if you have the zero mode, you have to have 2 pi over L i, where i goes from 0 to whatever L. So you have to have periodic boundary conditions, OK? So with periodic boundary conditions, there's no way of putting a chiral mode, a one single chiral mode, on a disk. So the appropriate description, just because I get an odd number of levels, the appropriate description would be this. I know I have to have a chiral mode because you know whether I have a chiral mode or not, is not dependent on, on, on whether I can put the system on different geometries. 
physically, if I look in the lab, I now have to carry on, I have to have a carry on mode. But what happens is that there is a way of making this consistent with chiral, with having a chiral mode and this symmetry and the doubling, and it's just this. Do you agree? But what are the what are, what what is the momentum of this? K okay, is two is pi over L times. What are the allow momentas for this to happen? If if the length the the separation here it here is two pi over L. Pi times two n plus one. Thank you. Okay, pi times two n plus one. So that means that this system has anti-periodic boundary conditions. So it's the only way to put a Majorana. This is a Majorana mode, the chiral Majorana mode. You can clearly, you know, see it because it's a superconductor and it's just one single mode. And there's only one way to do that, and that's with anti-periodic boundary conditions. However, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this system and insert flux, localized flux. And I'm going to insert flux um, um, 2 pi, but it's in units of what? H over, it's a superconductor over 2e. So really it's a flux that the momentum sees which is pi. Okay? When I insert flux, the momentum here when you surround the edge picks up another pi or pi over L. Right? So by inserting flux pi I move from anti-periodic boundary conditions to what? Periodic boundary conditions. So now if I was to plot the edge mode, there's still a gapless edge mode running around. I haven't done anything. I've just inserted flux in the superconductor. It would have to look like this because I have periodic boundary conditions. So it has to have this mode. Now I run into the same problem. How can I have a doubled Hamiltonian with an odd number of states? What's the solution? I've done something to the system. Where's the, where's the remaining state that would make this even. Where? Come on, nobody is, it's not like ISIS territory. Nobody's going to kill you if you get the wrong answer. <laughs> what? What? Uh, where's, where's the other mode? At the same place? So this mode is localized. Is it, it has to be at the same energy. It has to be at the same energy. That's for sure. Where is it? Well, I've, I've inserted it with localized flux, so there is a preferred position. So there's a mode, one single mode, localized at the vortex of, at the core of the vortex. And this core of the vortex, so you have another zero mode, localized at the core of the vortex, okay, in that diagram. And it has to be only one zero mode, because if it was, this system still, still respects particle hole redundancy or particle hole symmetry so the spectrum of the vortex is gapped but if you didn't have a mode at zero energy you'd have a mode at plus and minus e so you'd have two modes that would be again in contradiction because the edge has an odd number of modes so you have to have one mode localized on the vortex and that's localized at zero energy and that's the end of um, um, Alexander's wire that's a Majorana fermion that's a gamma Okay, so this is the Majorana fermion. You can actually express it if I introduce, you know, I can if I introduce two vortices, for example. I can make this have anti-periodic boundary conditions again, and I can make I would have if they're far away, this would have one Majorana, this would have one Majorana. I can actually choose a path between them and draw this and the Hamiltonian on this path make it look like like the one D Majorana chain between the two vortices. So, so defects 
vortices are defects in chiral superconductors have Majorana fermions. Okay? And if defects have Majorana fermions, what's the classification of defects? So what did, the, what did we learn in the past lecture that happens if you take two Majoranas and put them together? Hmm? They gap. But one Majorana is fine. So what's the classification of defects? Z, Z2. Okay? And you can clearly see that this is different than the classification of the superconductor because the superconductor would have one edge mode, two edge modes, three edge modes, four edge modes. The classification of the superconductor by itself, the chiral superconductor is Z. The defect classification is Z2, and I don't have time to go through it, but there's another classification, which is Z16. It's not entirely Z16, it's a semi-product, which is the classification of, the, of just the bulk of the superconductor. The classification of the edge of the superconductor is Z, the number of chiral Majorana modes. The defect is Z2. And there's Z16 of the bulk, but I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, references for the people that are interested. So thank you.